today was the only uh, woman to have been ordained in the Church of England to have become a bishop. Um, so she was something of a first. I mean, now, as you know, they're two a penny, but... Um, <laughs> And uh, I actually had the great pleasure of meeting Helen Ann for the first time last week uh, at the consecration in York of uh, the new Bishop of Hull, um, who is also a woman. So, as you can tell, the rot has really set in now. Um, <laughs> if that person really thinks I've meant that seriously, uh, I, I, I'll gladly have a conversation afterwards. Um, Helen Ann, we're delighted that you're here. We're really glad that you've been able to come and we very much look forward to hearing you and afterwards there'll be an opportunity for questions. So without any more ado to address the question, mind the gap with God, Helen Ann. Thank you very much, Bishop Richard. Can I just check that uh, everybody can hear me all right? Just wave your hat, yes, I've got a thumb up from the back, that's great. Thank you, Bishop Richard, thank you for your introduction. Um, a lot of people do say to me, oh, what's it like being a woman bishop? And I say, well, I don't know what it's like to be a man bishop, so <laughs> I'm just a bishop. A bishop's a bishop, and it is wonderful to be here. I'm, I'm very privileged and pleased to be invited to to speak to you. Thank you to, to Bishop Richard for the invitation. Thank you all for your, for your welcome and thank you for your hospitality. I think it's probably a safe bet, as a friend of mine said, uh, to get a bishop to talk about the gap with God um, because in theory um, I should know all about that. And I think what I want to begin by saying is that the most important word um, up there is the word with. And indeed, Sam Wells makes that very point um, in his new book that I came across just the other day, um, Being With God. He talks about the importance, actually, of God being with us. So even though we talk about the gap, there's always a sense that God is present with us, even when it seems that God is not. But what I want to do this afternoon is to talk to you a little bit about this gap, about what it means, about what the implications are for, for our mission, our ministry, and how we participate in what God is doing in this place at this time. It seems appropriate as I share those reflections that I also share with you something of my own context, um, because that, for me, is part of what it means to articulate the gap. Before I left New Zealand to come to England last week, I had a catch-up with Brother Brian, who's a Franciscan brother, who's part of the Franciscan community that's situated right next to my, my office um, in Hamilton. And Brother Brian, who is the most amazing and active 90-year-old that you're ever likely to meet, um, told me that his 93-year-old sister, Rachel, is a parishioner in Wentnor. Yeah. <laughs> Rachel Bright. Um, Rachel Bright, her brother, uh, Brother Brian, um, I was speaking to last week. So um, Brother Brian's a remarkable man of incredible spiritual depth that when I'm in his company, I really do feel a sense of the gap with God that is full of hope and full of mystery. And it's inspiring and encouraging on my journey of discipleship. And I think in a way that this speaks really strongly of an innate human desire to find a place to dwell in the gap. It's no mere coincidence, I think, that a lot of the imagery that's associated with the early church evoked that of the household, the place of gathering, of joy, of pain, food, conversation, laughter, silence, and stillness. And when we are displaced from home, it can be quite disorienting and debilitating. The image that you can see on the top left of your screen is of the transitional cathedral in the New Zealand South Island city of Christchurch, otherwise known as the Cardboard Cathedral, because 
It is quite literally made of cardboard tubes designed by the Japanese artist and architect Shigeru Ban. And it has temporarily replaced the cathedral in the square in Christchurch, which was destroyed during the February 11 Canterbury earthquakes. The sense of displacement from home throughout that diocese has been quite severe and is ongoing. And making sense of the place and the presence of God in the midst of all of that has not been easy, but it has borne fruit and it has brought hope. The image on the right of the screen is from one of our Anglican primary schools in my diocese, Southall School. It's taken outside their chapel. And what struck me about this image when I took the photograph recently were the gaps in the cross itself, in the cross that bore Jesus, new life ultimately emerged. Without the resurrection, we cannot proclaim confidence in our faith and what the gaps in our faith might mean. I can't begin this talk really without a personal reflection on gap in as much as my experience of moving to New Zealand three years ago to do one job, teaching, then somewhat unexpectedly finding myself in this Episcopal role has given me a profound sense of gap with God for no other reason than this somewhat light-hearted example. This picture is of Christmas Day 2014 at the deanery in Hamilton. And you will note that this does not really look like a Northern Hemisphere Christmas table. Finding one's theology turned literally upside down by the shift in seasons caused me considerable confusion. Advent in spring and Lent and Easter in autumn I noticed actually that the vibrant, fiery colours of the autumn made brilliant sense on the Feast of Pentecost. I recall driving down a street on Pentecost Sunday and the wind was whipping up a blizzard of leaves, of red leaves, bright red leaves, and it was one of those moments that really mattered to my making sense of the gaps with God that inevitably occur when we shift from one culture to another. And in that sense, certainly travel is something that accentuates the gap. New Zealand is about as far away as you can go on a plane without coming back again. 25 hours minimum. It was on Christmas Day 1814 that the Church Missionary Society Samuel Marsden preached the first sermon in the far north of the North Island at Oihi Bay. Marsden was only able to do so because of the friendship that he had established with the Maori chief named Ruatara. Marsden and Ruatara together enabled the word of God to take root. And now, 200 years ago, that's actually quite recent. Working out the gap with God that is present in diverse cultures is something that in a sense captures the very essence of Anglicanism. And the New Zealand province, of which I am a part, has been very intentional about that. And I want to share with you a little bit about that to help you understand this sense of processing gap in culture. The New Zealand uh, Anglican Church is called the Anglican Church in Aotearoa, New Zealand and Polynesia. And it covers the islands of New Zealand, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, and American Samoa. And here I am with some sisters of the holy name in Suva, which is in Fiji, and Archbishop Winston Halapua, who is one of the three archbishops who act as one, reflective of the cultures of our islands, Pacifica, Māori and European. Relationships with Māori in my diocese are absolutely vital. Every single square centimetre of land was confiscated by the British troops during the wars of 
the 18th and 19th centuries, making sense of God and of the gaps with God together in that place requires careful, patient, gracious, often painful journeying into deeper reconciliation. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a citadel because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? I have a telescope at home because I have a lifelong fascination with the night sky. When I was quite young, a friend asked me what did I want to be when I grew up? And I proudly announced that when I grew up, I wanted to be an astrologer. Now, I was only about seven at the time, and it was one of those instances where my mother very quickly corrected that, of course, what I really meant was I wanted to be an astronomer. It had something to do with the stars anyway. But when I was young, my father built a telescope with a physics teacher friend who lived up the road from us in Sunderland, where I grew up. They completed it around about the time that Halley's Comet appeared in the sky in 1985 and 1986. Don't know if any of you here remember that. I remember neighbours queuing round the street to take a look at it. And after a temporary setback involving an over-enthusiastic teenage boy falling over the telescope and giving everyone a great view of the grass, we eventually managed to look at this object in the sky and marvel at it. Marvel at the sense of gap that it seemed to create between us and God, our maker. Us and the comet, all part of creation together. Because where we live is relatively clear of street lighting, in the garden at the rear of our house, some nights I just stand outside and marvel at the stars and planets. To my finely tuned northern hemisphere eyes, however, the moon still looks a little bit upside down. So I sometimes stand in the back and sort of look at it <laughs> like that to regain a sense of familiarity. Now the interplay between science and religion, of course, is a rich area to explore. And I'm not a scientist, so I do not want to get out of my depth. There are probably many of you here that are far more knowledgeable than I am about this topic. However, the God of the gaps idea is often located in scientific debate as a way of explaining things that science apparently cannot. One commentator reflecting on the work of John Polkinghorn reflects that while aspects of so-called God of the gaps theory are contentious, at the very least, chaos theory indicates that a lot of nature is underdetermined. And in that subtlety of phrase, so not indeterminate, but underdeterminate, there is room for God. In Polkinghorne's understanding, God determines what is underdetermined. Now, his suggestions are not without critique, and many alternates are offered, such as process theology, which places emphasis upon the way in which God can persuade moral influence on events and processes in the world, or the differentiated approach, which seeks to distinguish between a pure creator language of God and a providence language, which is only applicable to human beings being capable of responding actively to their conditions. Just the other day, when I was in a bookshop, I came across this rather interesting book, which is nothing, a very short introduction. <laughs> I sort of half expected it to be completely blank. That would sort of be appropriate, but it is full of words. And I sort of flicked through it, and when I got to page 41, 
my eyebrows were peaked with interest because the writer, Frank Close, begins the chapter on space by saying, it was many years ago when still a novice in popularization that I was asked to convince an Anglican bishop versed in the creation myths of Genesis that the universe had emerged 14 billion years previously from a big bang. And so it goes on. Now, I don't know which Anglican bishop Frank Close was dealing with, but it seems to be important that we are, each one of us, created. Now, that's a very basic and bold statement to make, but I think it implies that that sense of God with us matters more than anything. It matters more than nothing. It matters most of all. It would appear, as indeed our sample from Psalm 8 just a moment ago that I quoted, that scripture has a great deal to say about heaven and earth and the place of God's kingdom in that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord's Prayer is a command from Jesus. Lord, teach us to pray, the disciples say. And Jesus replies, when you pray, say. He doesn't say, when you pray, you might like to turn to page 453 and choose option 1, 2 or 3. Jesus says, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The book of Revelation from which this quotation on the screen comes from provides us with rich and at times frankly terrifying material to help us navigate the gap with God. Revelation is in many ways a space to explore the gap. Yes, it is strange and terrifying, but it is also uplifting and vision setting with a strong focus on the person of Jesus Christ. Eschatology and apocalyptic, which are very much the worldview of Revelation, are in many ways the language of the gap. And as Christians, I think we ought to embrace rather than reject that language. After all, we're often very happy to enter the world of film, which often presents us with all sorts of outlandish apocalyptic imagery and stories that actually take their origins from a much greater narrative of which we are a part. But we're often left, I think, with a sense of, a rather overwhelming sense, that the gap with God is, well, it's just big. <laughs> an Episcopal friend of mine, uh, Stephen Pickard, who's an Australian bishop, tells the story quite recently when he was trying to dash through immigration to catch an internal domestic flight in Australia and he was quite late so he was quite keen to get through biosecurity and immigration and when he got to the lady at the immigration counter she looked at his documents, spent a bit of time reading it and said to him you're a minister of religion it's kind of fateful words really if you're trying to be in a hurry and he said, yes, yes, I am, thinking, hurry up, give me, my, give me my documents. And she then said to him, you got any advice? <laughs> this was not really what he was wanting. <laughs> and he just looked at her and said, it's big. Took his documents and ran out, <laughs> leaving her to ponder the mystery of those words. But I think in so many ways, those words just about sum up what the gap's about. It's big. These songs, which you're probably familiar with, remind me of many summer camps I spent as a curate. These two songs were used all the time with accompanying actions. You've probably done them yourselves. Reinforcing this sense of the bigness. God is simply a great big God. Therefore, the gap is also a great 
big gap. But we might want to insert some other words into that sentence. God is. How about unknowable? Romans 11, 33 to 36. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Or who has given a gift to him to receive a gift in return? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Or perhaps God is love. Perhaps that's the missing word above. If we look at the totality of Paul's argument in this chapter of his letter to the Romans, what Paul is saying, quite simply, is that God gives his gift out of love for us. Not out of admiration for how good we are, but simply out of love for us. We are never in a position, therefore, to be superior over one another. We are all on the same footing. Nicholas King says about this passage that we should allow ourselves to be swept up by the flood of joy here because it really is this outpouring of love that animates Paul's profoundest insights about what God has done for us in Christ. And we cannot understand love sometimes. Even Albert Einstein, in a letter to his daughter, said this, Love is power because it multiplies the best we have and allows humanity not to be extinguished in their blind selfishness. Love unfolds and reveals. For love, we live and die. Love is God, and God is love. There is, in a sense, an endless list of potential words to fill the gap in that sentence above. Each word, each image, tells us something about the gap, something that is helpful, sometimes less so, perhaps. In this famous painting of the return of the prodigal son, Rembrandt depicts the father's hands with one hand that is masculine and one hand that is feminine. And I know there's been a bit of debate recently here about the language that we use for God. Perhaps we should be doing more of is allowing God to be God, and in that, discovering the fullness of that in Jesus Christ, whose likeness we are called to make known in all that we say and all that we do. The narrative of the calming of the storm that you can see here depicted in the stained glass window on the right evoked for me a childhood memory of a particularly stormy crossing of the English Channel where practically everyone was flat out with sick bags and my mother calmly cradled my head in her arms the whole journey and how her arm must have utterly ached and I know it did. Of course I knew nothing of that at the time. Only subsequent conversations have confirmed that indeed that was the case. Any sense of gap is not theoretical. Consider, for example, a Christian response to the thousands of displaced people, migrants, caught in the gaps, and why we need to be concerned about those gaps, to look after those in the gaps and to do something about it. God is in all of it, whether we choose to see it that way or not. Here on the cross, the gap seems unbearably infinite, yet at one and the same time, infinitely intimate. I'm always struck by how empty Holy Saturday seems. The gap between Good Friday and Easter Day seems unbearable each year with more intensity. It is about slowing down, about noticing the gap in a certain way. Clive James, who I recently discovered writes poetry, said that writing poetry was all about 
trying to turn a phrase until it captures the light. So with that in mind, the gap seems to be God-filled rather than a void of nothingness. Am I a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? Here are a couple of perspectives on gaps. The writer Walker Percy, who was a Catholic philosopher and author from Louisiana, says that the search is what anyone would undertake if he were not sunk in the everydayness of his own life. To become aware of the possibility of the search is to be onto something. Not to be onto something is to be in despair. So it's important to go on a journey in search of what the gap with God might mean. Archbishop Rowan Williams, in an interview given when he was Bishop of Monmouth, said this, Is the meaning in the gaps, or is the meaning in the fact that the gaps are between something? What better way is there to describe the journey of faith as a searching after God in the gaps? W.H. Auden, in his oratorio, For the Time Being, has one of the wise men saying this, to discover how to be human now is the reason we follow this star. So perspective matters when we come to explore the gap with God. Stephen Pickard, who I told that story about a moment ago, talks about finding God in the gap. I recall a comment of Stanley Hauerwas that the appropriate location for Christian ethics was always in the middle of things. His point was that we did not have the luxury of beginning outside or at the periphery of life. We begin and proceed, encompassed by the God who is our beginning and end, and who is the holy presence in and through all things. Theology begins in the middle of our lives. They're complex and often painful circumstances and joyful celebrations. It's in the middle or nowhere at all. So in that sense, the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. These words from the Johannine prologue translated here by Nicholas King, make the point about being in the middle rather well. You might recognise this photo taken from the Royal Three Counties show. Now my diocese covers a modest space of 30,000 square kilometres <laughs> and is predominantly rural. As I drive around, which I do quite a lot, I'm constantly aware of the presence of God in creation and in the joy and struggle of that. Yet at times the gaps between God and people seem so insurmountable. What to do about that question is something that happens in the asking and discussion of it, pointing to an answer. My Pacifica sisters and brothers talk about the importance of a concept called Talanoa, which is a word that means that the endless conversation about a topic means that in the conversation there is an answer as well as a question. It basically literally means keep on talking, because in your talking you will fill the gap and find an answer to what you are looking for. Now this desire to work in the gaps with God is not a new one. Another way of exploring further back this insight is with a rabbinic tradition of black fire on white fire. This phrase comes from a midrash written around the years 400 to 600. It says this, that the Torah is full of holy fire it was written with a black fire upon a white fire. The black fire refers 
to the letters that you see on the page of scripture and the actual words written down. The white fire refers to the spaces in between and all around the letters. Together, in that rabbinical understanding of scripture, black fire and white fire make up the whole of Torah. In that sense, while we read scripture, it is in our telling of it, in our interpreting of it, in our singing our songs, telling our stories alongside the meaning of the text, that we discover a deeper mystery in the gap with God. It's no mere coincidence, I think, that many current theological debates around the Anglican communion can be traced back to how you read and interpret scripture. There's a book by a Jewish woman called Betty Reutemann entitled Black Fire on White Fire, an essay on Jewish hermeneutics. And she talks about the tools of contemporary semiotic theory to analyze rabbinic hermeneutics, discovering what she argues is a very striking modernness in these early forms of textual interpretation. She argues that there's always a double-layered meaning to rabbinic exegesis that refers both to its own world, the here and now, and to the eternal and transcendent presence of God working in and through and all things. In our lives, God calls us to live often in the places in between. And this can be a risky and often difficult place to be, but it ultimately bears witness to the in-between God, the God on the margins, on the edges of life and society. So the outworking of our faith, literally, is always at the crossroads of life, the points of intersection where glimpses of God's Holy Spirit may be discerned because we are disciples of Christ. This is another way of giving expression to that understanding of Holy Saturday that I talked about a minute ago. Stephen Pickard talks about a theology of the veranda or the decking or the patio even, if you like, that space in between our homes and our garden. Now the point about that uh, to be aware of is that the patio is often round the back of the house and there's uh, Bishop John Pritchard says, sometimes in the church we spend far too much time in the back garden and not enough time actually out on the streets. We're always called to reflect, but we're always called to go out and to make something of that gap together. So when we talk about minding the gap with God, there are, I think, three points that we need to think carefully about. What does it mean to be concerned about the gap with God? What does it mean to look after the gap with God? And ultimately, what does it mean to do something about it? There are three aspects of minding this gap that I want to turn to you briefly now using the lens of scripture. The three narratives that I want to use are the Emmaus Road from the Gospel of Luke, The confession of Peter is found in Mark's version of that story, and the rather abrupt, shorter ending of Mark's gospel. I want to suggest that the gap is all about living in the life of the triune God, and that is a life and a gap that is dynamic. And it is a life and a gap that each one plays a part in plays our part in concern, in care, and ultimately in action. Because the life of discipleship is all about being called out in God's mission into our world. So first of all, what does it mean to be concerned about the gap? I'm calling this, it's all about the journey of faith. To be concerned about the gap with God is all about being on a journey of faith. The idea of pilgrimage is, I think, one that we can all relate to. Sometimes intentional and organized, yet always open to unexpected happenings. Sometimes unintentional 
uninvited, a journey that we had not expected to be on. We resist, we yield, God draws us on in the gap. Now Luke's narrative of the disciples on the road to Emmaus has been a constant in my own journey of faith. And it's a narrative that I find myself returning to again and again. It has, I think to all of us, an air of deep familiarity. And yet, when we read a scripture passage again, we can often be pulled up by a new surprise, perhaps something that we didn't notice at first, perhaps. It is a dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door. You step out on the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. It seemed appropriate for me to quote here from The Lord of the Rings, because, as you know, New Zealand is where it all happened. <laughs> Indeed, when I became Bishop of Waikato, I was delighted to discover that the film set of Hobbiton is in my diocese, situated in the parish of All Saints, Mata Mata. Tolkien's epic stories of the adventures of Frodo and his friends have been part of the landscape of our literary culture for decades. And of course, most recently, by the work of Sir Peter Jackson. I am sometimes referred to as the Bishop of the Shire. <laughs> And I have been asked whether in tricky Episcopal situations I am tempted to take hold of my pastoral staff and place it into the ground emphatically with my best Gandalfian voice, you shall not pass. <laughs> but I don't do that, of course. <laughs> I think it sometimes, but I never do it. <laughs> but I do, in a serious note, take a lot of encouragement from Tolkien's writing and the gradual making sense of the journey that progresses in the Lord of the Rings. And it is a journey that is very heavily Christian in its nature. The journey through the gap with God is never straightforward. At Greenbelt 2011, Rob Bell spoke about his life as a Christian and read from Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. His exegesis at this point was both simple and profound. You can't see far with a lamp. It's not a torch, nor is it a searchlight. It's a lamp. Following God's light sheds light for the way, but it is enough just for the next step. As the disciples on the Emmaus Road took their steps, it was in the breaking of the bread that all became clear and the gap made sense. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day enough light for the next step. Last November, I spent a few days with year 10 students from our diocesan school for girls in Hamilton. Aside from the fact that after three days, I could hardly move due to all sorts of camp activities, like surfing, I had really great technique on the beach, certainly not replicated in the water, <laughs> but it was the caving that was my worst nightmare, not least when our very chirpy and cheery instructor asked us to turn off our headlamps and then be guided in complete darkness up, up and over a rock to splash down in water on the other side. I was at the rear of our group, and the poor year 10 girl by the name of Chloe had the responsibility for getting the bishop safely up and over the rock without too much incident, which she managed to great encouragement and cheering from the other girls. But it made me very, very aware of the sheer vulnerability of the journey through the gap, often in complete darkness, with God. Early one morning, as the earth was slowly waking up, I looked down on the mist rolling over the landscape from high above, sat in a window seat as I headed to a meeting in the South Island. I became mesmerized by the ways in which the light gradually began to shift and change the contours of the ground below. The mountains, Ruapehu, Tongariro, and Naraho 
topped with snow, which began to glisten and sparkle, and the air looked stunningly clear. But it was the winding Waikato River that caught my eye and made me think. Usually, I begin a greeting when I'm with my Maori colleagues by saying the phrase, Waikato Tanifa Rau, he piko he tanifa, he piko he tanifa, he piko he tanifa. Waikato of a hundred guardians. At every bend in the river, there's a guardian. Now this might seem like an obvious point, but rivers don't really flow in straight lines. They bend and forge their path over the slow passage of time in microscopic detail, far beyond the scope of human eyes. All of this contrasts somewhat with other pathways of transport, roads, and indeed railways. Now, growing up in the northeast of England, just occasionally you would find yourself on what seemed to be like an impossibly straight road, a legacy of the period when parts of this country were under the power of the Roman Empire. The Romans designed roads for maximum efficiency. They were straight. Point A to point B, straight road. Now the Emmaus Road, of course, itself wasn't especially straight, but if we think of it in terms of the flowing river, then I think we are closer to understanding aspects of its deeper meaning for our journeys of faith in the gap with God for today. Two disciples are walking along a road. They are emotionally and physically exhausted and are filled with disappointment and despair. They do what most people do in response to trauma through a shared experience. They discuss what happened. When I picture the scene in my mind, I see the two of them with their heads downcast. They are turned in on themselves and are trying to make sense of all that has happened. So caught up in themselves as they are, they don't notice the stranger when he draws alongside them. I imagine that they are a bit put out at this man who has intruded on their space and who seems not to know about the things that have happened. The rest of the narrative, of course, we know well. How the stranger is, of course, Jesus himself. And how they realise this at the moment of the breaking of the bread and the true meaning of their companionship, their breaking bread with one another, comes alive and nothing is ever the same again. That is the meaning of that word companion. It literally means to share bread with, to feed the one alongside you, not just with food, but with the bread of life and life in all its fullness. The Emmaus Road story is actually a very Anglican story. It's actually a worship service. It begins with a gathering, a sense of where the people are, confession, if you like, of dreams laid bare and disappointments in all their rawness. Prayers follow as the two disciples petition Jesus to stay with them. The scriptures are told and explained as Jesus does, though it might not always be wise for the preacher to begin by telling your congregation that they are fools. You might want to skip that bit. Then the meal is shared. The resurrected Christ, who fills the gap with God, is revealed to them. And the disciples are so inspired by their encounter that they sprint back to Jerusalem to tell of what has happened to them. So what begins with a rather slow pace ends with great energy. The journey is only just beginning. Even though they have returned to where they started, everything has changed. And I wonder how many of us feel so energised by worship that we cannot wait to get out of church, for the right reasons, and share the good news with everyone we might see on our way home. But I wonder if we might connect what we encounter in the breaking of bread with how we love our neighbour, with the words we use with and about one another, with the gestures of love and care that we use with our advocacy for those who are in difficult and unjust situations that we may hear about. I wonder what difference our gathering makes to understanding the gap with God. What difference it could continue to make to our lives and the lives of others. 
If we realise the gap with God is full of this sort of potential, then of course we ought to be concerned by what happens in the gap. In our experiences of journeying in the gap with God, we may realise that while at times we can sit and reflect on what we see, we often gain the most from the companions that we have shared the day with, through the unexpected and expected conversations that we can have, we learn more about our walk with Jesus, and perhaps most importantly of all, that Jesus comes alongside us at times that can rarely be predicted or scripted. The ordinary things of life, a journey, people, food, conversation, and in the beauty of creation, the river and the mountain. The New Zealand liturgist Joy Cowley writes, On that day of rain I walked with you, seeing but not seeing you in wet trees, hearing but not hearing you in the symphony of water sounds played by a flooded stream. You were everywhere and yet closer than the sanctuary of my umbrella, closer than a misted breath. I didn't need to ask who you were for my heart burned with recognition. Fearing that I would lose you, I cried, O oh Lord, come home with me. You smiled through the dancing rain, the puddles, the grey fence posts, and you whispered, Ah, I am already there. It is 11 kilometres to Emmaus and 11 kilometres back to Jerusalem. You'll need to work out the mileage equivalent because I deal with the kilometres where I am. The story is bound up in a discipleship with an accent on travel and a wandering sense of church measured by the steps of Jesus. We need to commit to the whole journey of God. Our lives move back and forth along the Emmaus Road, the gap between Jerusalem and Emmaus and Emmaus and Jerusalem. We journey constantly back and forth through the gap from crucifixion to resurrection and beyond, which is why looking after the gap is vital. And to that, I now turn. I think it's because I was ordained bishop on the feast of the confession of St. Peter that I've developed an affinity with this passage and its version in Mark's Gospel. The core question of identity that presses down in the narrative and bursts forth in a radiant dawning light is one that I come back to again and again. Our identity matters and our understanding of God's identity matters. We need to look after the gap with God and that is all about the life of discipleship. In this poem, Seamus Heaney reflects on the place of identity and who defines it? That last stanza. Did sea define the land or land the sea? Each drew new meaning from the wave's collision. Sea broke on land to full identity. It suggests that identity is forged in a relationship, here between land and sea, in the gospel between Jesus and his disciples. Now that says a lot about the need to look after the gap with God, the need to take care in our articulation, not just of who we are, but of whose we are. So looking after the gap with God requires both wisdom and a great deal of patience. This passage is often seen as the hinge point of Mark's gospel. Up to this point, Mark's narrative, though told with relative pace when compared to the other Gospels, begins to gradually slow down as we walk with Christ in the shadow of the cross. And Mark's crafting of the narrative begins very slowly to isolate Jesus more and more, an isolation which will be complete only when Jesus hangs dying on the cross. Now, if you haven't seen the film Calvary, I'd recommend you see it. It is certainly not an easy film to watch. 
I watched it on a plane journey coming back from a holiday in Fiji, and it certainly, if you've seen the film, it certainly shifted my mood from the frivolity of holiday to the crushing reality of life. It tells the story of an Irish Catholic priest, Father James, who receives notice in the confessional at the start of the film that he will die a week's hence. As we journey through each day in the film, we see the brokenness of the characters around him and his own growing isolation towards the inevitable end. And beyond that, well, the ending of the film is the part that leaves you wondering. So I won't say what happens, only that we gain a sense of an ending through an encounter between his daughter and the man who ultimately kills him which, in an ending, is possibly more of a beginning, which is exactly how the gospel narrative works. If Peter was indeed Mark's eyewitness to writing his gospel, then we have here an account that is in many ways Peter's own. From this point in the story onwards, the broad scenario is of a trip on foot, a journey to Jerusalem, one way of viewing this beginning part of the narrative is that in asking the question about identity, who do you say that I am, Jesus knows exactly who he is and is testing the disciples to see whether or not they know who Jesus is as well. And that's certainly the perspective of most commentaries on this passage. But one commentator who writes from the social perspective, the social cultural context perspective, comments that it may be also that it is in fact Jesus who needs to have confirmed who he is by other people. And it is in the vulnerability of the disciples from whom Jesus must get this information. In Christ, we move together in looking after the gap with the knowledge and love of God, inspired and continually buffeted by the Holy Spirit. For Jesus, in these verses, the crucial point is in asserting his status from his title, the honour that being Messiah bestows upon him and upon God's mission in and through him. So when Peter declares Jesus to be the Messiah in verse 30, he asserts that Jesus' authority is to proclaim the reign of God and is divinely authorised. And this is revealed each time we celebrate the Eucharist together. Time and time again, we look after the gap with God in the celebration of the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the means by which we look after the gap with God, precisely because in this, we remember, we put Christ's body back together through our worship, through our sharing of bread and wine. Now, of course, there's much more in that passage about loyalty, which is emphasized by Jesus's rebuke to Peter in verse 33, get behind me, Satan, a word which means tester of loyalties. The call to take up the cross would have shocked those who first heard it. This is exactly what discipleship involved. This is what looking after the gap with God involved. Jesus' words imply that following him is not easy. But if the disciples were ashamed of him and were reluctant to embrace his way of suffering, the Son of Man would be ashamed of them when he came in glory. Finally, doing something about the gap. When we do something about the gap, we are saying a lot about the dynamic nature of that gap with God. When I was a teenager, I had a profound experience of the presence of God in the silence of a packed Durham Cathedral on Advent Sunday evening. The experience was so profound that I remember it vividly to this day. This memory of presence is, however, accompanied by a time when I felt utter 
emptiness. As a university undergraduate, one evening, walking back to my hall of residence, following a theology society talk on prayer, the speaker had very cleverly and persuasively deconstructed prayer to nothing more than a psychological crutch that we use to help us feel better. As I walked, the literal darkness around me seemed to reflect an acute awareness of God's absence. Of course, in hindsight, God was not absent. God was actually very present. Only sometimes we want to ask the question, God, where are you? Giving human expression to Jesus' cry of abandonment of the cross says a lot about doing something about the gap. We begin with prayer, not because it makes us feel better, but because by it we are connected to God in communication and in relationship, in words and in silence. Seamus Heaney's poem, Scaffolding, was one of his earliest poems. And it was actually written to his wife at a point of stress in their relationship. Masons, when they start upon a building, are careful to test out the scaffolding, make sure the planks won't slip at busy points, secure all ladders, tighten vaulted joints. And yet all of this comes down when the job's done, showing off walls of shore and solid stone. So if, my dear, there sometimes seems to be old bridges breaking between you and me, never fear. We may let the scaffolds fall, confident that we have built our wall. Heaney's last words to his wife before he died in August 2013 were in the form of a text message. In Latin, the words, noli timere, do not be afraid. Matthew chapter 14, after Jesus feeds thousands in the desert, he sends his disciples away in a boat and goes up a mountain alone to pray. That night, a storm hits the boat, which sits out alone on the water. The disciples, panicked and trying to survive, see Jesus walking towards them across the waves. They think he is a ghost. But he replies, be of good cheer, it's me. Do not be afraid. Sometimes it takes courage to be a bearer of faith in the gap with God, to show others the light of Christ, to hold the gap with God that will inevitably be felt by people in different ways at different times. And that takes wisdom to discern, to care and to be patient in allowing others the space they need to work with the gap. So I want now, finally, to take us to the end of Mark's Gospel, accurately depicted here in the form of the Brick Testament. Mark chapter 16, verse 8. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Scottish crime writer Ian Rankin was once asked about his novels, which typically don't end all neat and tidy. One story in particular finishes with two of the main characters having a conversation off the page. Rankin explained that his American publisher wasn't having any of this, and he had to write an extra chapter for the market in the United States. But why end with a conversation that we can, cannot read but only imagine? Well, life's just not like that, was his reply. Rarely do things end neatly, with all the I's dotted and the T's crossed. That, in a sense, is where the gap at the end of this narrative of Mark's Gospel fits in. There was death, and there was resurrection, but then what? What becomes of the gap that is an ending and a beginning? Well, our Gospel writer Mark wants to tell the story because of a relationship. He wants to tell the story by way of encouragement to that community who are facing persecution. However, there's only one problem 
If your challenge was to get the story right, to create a record so compelling that others would come to faith by that story, you wouldn't think that you would leave the story the way Mark does, or perhaps you would. Now, some have suggested that a theologically keen Easter bunny must have nibbled the last page of the manuscript and something must be lost. Or is Mark just teasing us? We know that the women must have said something to someone because here we are today. But perhaps in the short ending of Mark, there is another explanation of that gap. Mark deliberately leaves the story open with a dot, 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 pointing forward to a future, to the unfinished, to this moment, right here, right now, to the time beyond here, the moment we emerge from this lecture theater through that door and head off for our refreshments. It's all about the gap. The young man said to the women, tell his disciples and Peter that if we want to see the risen Christ, then we need to go back to the beginning of Mark's gospel, where Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. We need to go back to the beginning of the gospel and reread the entire gospel in the light of the resurrection, realizing that after all, the time is now, the place is here, and the purpose is this. I love the spaciousness of this painting by the Scottish artist William MacTaggart. It is called The Coming of Saint Columba, and depicts the arrival of Columba to preach the gospel and bring Christianity to Scotland around the year 563. You can just make out the boat nearing the mainland. And if you look closely on the right, you will see some people perhaps a family huddled on the ground, the sea indicating that it must have been quite stormy. This is a vivid description of the dynamism of the gap, the now and the not yet, the point before the encounter with God and the possibility of what that encounter might bring. In my New Zealand context, depictions of the missionary Samuel Marsden arriving at Oihi Bay on his ship, the active, evoke a similar sense of the excitement of something new happening. The gap with God is dynamic and is constantly on the move. The image of the koru, or unfolding fern, is very popular in New Zealand. A constant sense of the unfoldingness of the gap, new shoots, new life, new possibilities, new things to learn about God. Stephen Pickard writes, we humans seem to spend much of our lives seeking the company of others. Indeed, we appear to be hardwired to invest considerable time and energy searching for sustaining relationships in society. The desire for human company goes hand in hand with the very normal human need for solitude. This is no surprise, for life together has many dimensions. Our desire for human companionship somehow in involves seeking God, and our search for God similarly involves an attraction to others. Seeking God involves being untwisted through attraction to God. This suggests that the human cry for God has its deepest origin in the life of the triune God. This Doing something about the gap with God is never just about us as individuals. It is precisely because our lives are inevitably and intimately bound up with one another. Paul's image of the body of Christ is crucial to helping us do something about the gap. Jesus says at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What is important in this passage is to remember that right before these words we read that the disciples worshipped Jesus but they doubted. Faith and doubt in the gap 
often go hand in hand. And it is encouraging, I think, to know that the disciples, even right at the end, still had questions. The gap is not to be taken for granted, but must always be nurtured by exploration and deeper understanding. The theologian Dan Hardy talks about the basis of this prayer inspired by the words of Augustine, who began his confessions thus. Great art thou, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is thy power, and infinite is thy wisdom. And man desires to praise thee, for he is a part of thy creation. He bears his mortality about with him, and carries the evidence of his sin, and the proof that thou dost resist the proud. Augustine's prayer suggests that our being created in God's image is not simply a finished matter. The image of God is something that we grow into, and growing into the image of God involves a journey of many dimensions. Dan Hardy writes, Creatures are created to move towards God. When creatures somehow lose that towardness, becoming obsessive at some point, separating from the whole of things and serving only themselves, then the creation loses its order. To lack attraction to others and to God is to suffer the inertia of self-attraction, in Luther's terms, to be twisted into self. There is a re restlessness in the triune God which we are caught up in. We are bound up in one another because we are bound into the mystery of God in movement, which is, as Bishop Stephen Picard writes, simultaneous and generative of community with God and each other. Seeking God, seeking one another, embodying this search through the life of the church, these things are mutually involving. All of this, all of this takes time. We are all on a point of pilgrimage in the gap with God. The Australian writer Michael Lunick writes in his poem, Another Way of Being, Nothing can be loved at speed. God leads us to the slow path, to the joyous insights of the pilgrim. Another way of knowing, another way of being. Amen. The gap is a place of renewable energy, which is constantly released through attentive listening to God and one another to remembering and celebrating, and to care, service, and joyfully telling and retelling the story of Jesus. This is the unfinished church of the end of Mark's gospel and of the Emmaus Road. The gap with God is filled with the lives of those who have faithfully borne witness in the past and who continue to do so in the present and on into the future. And so I want to leave the final word to our forebears in faith. In my context, any speech or talk is concluded by the singing of a song or a wayata, which is a way of acknowledging the theme or the word or the kopapa that is being spoken about. So I end with inviting us to listen to this song. You will hear it sung twice. It is a song to Mary, the mother of Jesus, the bearer of God incarnate, in whom the gap between divinity and humanity is joined. But this is a song which, when sung, is meant to honour the lives of all the ancestors in faith who have in their lives been concerned about the gap with God, who have looked after the gap with God and who have sought to do something about the gap with God. The rough translation of these words is as follows. Sing now to Mary. The name means woman who allows. It is said these hold the house of the people, the womb. Beautiful woman, generous woman, peaceful woman, the mother of the world. Oh.
Dan, thank you so much. You've given us a tremendous start. I don't think we've quite got time, unless there's somebody with a pressing question you'd like to ask straight away. We've got just a couple of minutes. Any immediate reactions? Am I missing somebody? I think, I think that's an indication that it might be time for tea. Um, <laughs> Helen Ann, you have really given us so much in your talk to us, and we're very grateful to you for giving us such a start to the gathering. Um, in helping us to uh, address the gap with God, you focus us firmly on the wonder of God, his mystery and his vastness, but you've also showed us ways in which we can find him as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We're enormously grateful. You've set the tone and you've really got us going well, so we're very, very grateful. Thank you very much.